I have for you something a little, shall we say, different for this Sunday. It's a piece of short humorous fiction by Hilaire Belloc entitled The Honest Man and the Devil. In this piece, we get a morality play of sorts. It's a dialogue, essentially. Well, sort of. Let's say it's a short story about a man, essentially, think of it as the literary version of The Devil Went Down to Georgia, well before that song was ever penned. It's... I had a hard time not laughing while recording this essay, and I I think it's worth remembering. And see, let me know in the comments what you think the lesson of this essay is. Again, it's short. I think in total the video is like about eight minutes long, if that. So let me know what you think the lesson that Belloc is trying to convey here, because it's clearly something where there is supposed to be a lesson garnered. Anyway, I hope you have a good day, and I hope you have a, a, a good Mass today. God bless. The Honest Man and the Devil by Hilaire Belloc A man who was justly proud of his uncompromising temper and love of truth had the misfortune the other night to wake at about three o'clock in the morning and to see the devil standing by his bedside, who begged him to sell him, the devil, his soul. I will do nothing of the kind, said the honest man in a mixture of sleepiness and alarm. Very well, said the devil, obviously annoyed. You shall go your way, but I warn you, if you will have nothing to do with me, I will have nothing to do with you. I ask for nothing better, said the honest man, turning over on his right side to get to sleep again. I desire to follow truth in all her ways, and to have nothing more to do with you. With these words he began to breathe regularly and mechanically, which warned the devil that the interview was now at an end. The devil, therefore, with a grunt, went out of the bedroom and shut the door loudly behind him, shaking all the furniture, which was a rude thing to do, but he was very much annoyed. Next morning, the honest man, before going out to business, dictated his letters, as he always did, into a phonograph. This little instrument, which, by the way, had been invented by the devil, though he did not know it, is commonly used in the houses of the busy for the reception of dictated correspondence, comic verse, love sonnets, and so forth. The honest man of whom I speak used the phonograph for his daily correspondence, which was enormous. He dictated his answers into it before leaving his private house, and during the afternoon his secretary would take those answers down. At about half past five, the honest man came back from his business and was met by his secretary in a very nervous way. I fear, sir, said the secretary, that there must be some mistake about your correspondence. I have taken it down exactly as was my duty, and certainly the voice sounded like yours, but the letters are hardly such as I could post without your first reading them. I have therefore not signed them in your name, and have kept them to show you upon your return. Here they are. Please read them carefully, and advise me as soon as possible. With these words, the secretary handed the documents to his employer, and went out of the room with his eyes full of nervous tears. The honest man put on a pair of gold spectacles and began to read. This is what he read. 1. The Laurels, Putney Heath, Southwest, November 9th. Dear Lady Wernside, Yes, I will come to Wernside House next Thursday. I do not know you well and shall feel out of place among your friends, but I need not stay long. I think to be, see- to be seen at such a gathering, even for a few moments, is of a general advantage to my business. Otherwise, I should certainly not come. One thing I beg of you, which is not to ask me a number of private questions under the illusion that you are doing me a favor. The habit is very unpleasant to me. I may add that though I am of the middle classes, like your late father, I have very good taste in furniture, and the inside of your house simply makes me sick. I am very faithfully yours, John Rowe. 2. The Laurels, Putney Heath, Southwest, November 9th. Dear Dr. Burton, I wish you would have come round this afternoon tomorrow morning and see my eldest child, James. There's nothing at all with him, but his mother is very nervous, because some Jill children with whom he went out to a party the other evening had developed mumps, and his voice is hoarse, which she idiotically believes to be a symptom of that disease. Your visit will cost me two guineas, but it is well worth my while to spend that sum to avoid her unbearable fussing. My advice to you as a man is to look at the child's tongue, give him some plain water by way of medicine, and go off again as quick as you can. Your fee will be the same in any case, and it is a ridic- ridiculous to waste time over such business. I am your sincere friend, John Rowe. Letter 3. The Laurels, 
Putney Heath Southwest, November 9th. Dear Dr. Mills, I enclose five guineas as a subscription for your new church. I confess that I do not clearly see what advantage this expenditure will do me, and what are the reasons for sending you the money at all. Your style of preaching is monotonous, and your doctrines, if they really are your doctrines, are particularly annoying to me. In fact, I think this kind of thing is a sort of blackmail. You know I cannot afford to have my name left out of your subscription list, and probably the same reason is causing many other neighbors of mine to part most unwillingly with a part of their property. Perhaps the best way out of it would be to form a sort of union, and to strike altogether against your demands. But I cannot waste any more time upon the matter, so here's your five guineas, and go away. Very faithfully yours, John Rowe. Letter 4. The Laurels. Putney Heath, Southwest, November 9th. My dear Alice, I will not send the small sum which you asked me as a brother to give you, though I am well aware that it would save you great worry. My reason for acting thus is that I feel a little annoyed when I have to pay even a small sum without the chance of any possible return, especially when I have to do it for someone who cannot make things uncomfortable for me if I refuse. I have a sort of sentimental feeling about you because you are my sister, and therefore my refusal does give me a slight, though a passing sense of discomfort. But that will very soon disappear, and when I balance it against the definite sacrifice of a sum of money, however small, I do not hesitate for a moment. Please do not write me again. Your affectionate brother, John Rowe. The Laurels, Putney Heath, Southwest, November 9th. Dear Sir, I enclose a check for two hundred and fifty pounds, my annual subscription to the local to the local fund for the party. I be beg you particularly to note that this subscription makes me the creditor of the party to the extent of over three thousand pounds, counting interest from the first subscription. I desire no reward or recognition for my payment of this sum beyond the baronetcy of which we spoke the last time I visited you in the presence of a third party. You need not fear my attitude in the approaching election. I am quite indifferent to parliamentary honors. I will take the chair five times and no more. I am prepared to attend one large garden party, three dinners, and a set of fireworks. I will have absolutely nothing to do with the printing, and I am always at your service, John Rowe. When the honest man had read these letters, he decided that they should not be posted in their present form, but trying to change them, he found himself unable to find those phrases which he could usually discover so easily for the purpose of his correspondence. He sent, therefore, for a secretary and told them to rewrite the letters himself according to his own judgment. With that, gentleman did, with great sp skill and speed, leaving the checks as it prepared and putting every matter in its proper light. Now, said the devil, have I brought you to your senses. No, said the honest man, preparing for sleep as before. You have not. You should have remembered that I have a secretary. Oh, the devil, said the devil impatiently. One cannot be thinking of everything. And he went out even more noisily than the night before. In this way, the honest man saved his soul, and at the same time his face, which, if it were the less valuable of the two organs, was none the less of great importance to him in this worldly sphere.